For over 30 years now, uh, world-renowned experts in their fields have visited Pomfret School in the winter term under the auspices of the Schwartz Visiting Fellow Program. This extraordinary multi-day speaker series is the result of the vision and generosity of Michael and Eric Schwartz. Michael graduated in the class of 1966 and Eric in the class of 1969. These eminent visiting fellows have enriched both the school and the greater Pomfret community, and we wish to extend our profound gratitude to Michael and to Eric for making this possible. So if you're watching Eric and Michael, thank you. This year, we are again fortunate to have a truly distinguished expert here on our campus to share her thoughts and her insights with us. Before Ms. Jacquet introduces our most recent today's and tomorrow's Schwartz Fellow, I must publicly thank both Ms. Jacquet uh, and Mr. Frigi for the work that they've done to bring our speaker here today, the logistics behind this, um, and um, Ms. Grassi also, thank you for everything you've done to help organize. But the logistics are really considerable and all, we are all very, very fortunate to be the beneficiaries of their dedication to the community and to this program. So can we please have a round of applause for Mr. <laughs> Ms. Jacquet and Mr. Frigi. And it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Ms. Jacquet to introduce Jessica Bruder. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. And you all look sharp. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Tim. And thank you for the continued support, um, Eric and Michael. I know you're watching out there somewhere. Hailed by the New Yorker as an acute and compassionate observer, Jessica Bruder reports on social injustice and the dark underbelly of American capitalism. Her book, Nomadland, Surviving America in the 21st Century, documents the lives of transient older Americans who travel from job to job, really out of economic necessity. With the nation's economic future seemingly more unequally and unstable every year, Bruder's book presents wonderfully humane and deeply troubling looks at how the American dream has failed some of our most vulnerable citizens. Bruder's latest work, co-authored with journalist Dale Maharaj, is Snowden's Box, Trust in the Age of Surveillance, which recounts their part in bringing the Ed Edward Snowden leak of NSA documents to light, the largest national security leak of the digital era. She is at work now on a book about the people working on the front lines of reproductive justice rights. A longtime contributor to the New York Times, Bruder teaches narrative storytelling at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and was named a 2019 New American Fellow. She speaks on income inequality, labor, social justice, subcultures, digital surveillance, the housing crisis, and immersion journalism. Please welcome Jessica Bruder to campus. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Testing. Do you read me? All right. Well, I'm not going to say the head of school lied to you just now, but he said I'm an expert. And I'm going to be honest to you, I'm kind of an expert in not being an expert. Let me explain. Um, I have a really, really weird job. That is the reason I'm here. Here are some of the things that happen while doing my one job. I might end up cleaning up a campground for a few weeks, chasing after this golf cart, picking up micro litter, cleaning broken bottles out of fire rings, all that, all that fun stuff. I might be learning from a bounty hunter how to break out of duct tape or handcuffs or pick locks or get out of a trunk. This ended better than it looks. I might be visiting with medical migrants and tourists, a town in Mexico called Los Algodones, also known as the Molar City, which is a riff on Detroit, the Motor City. This is a town made of 400 dentists. I might be going to Burning Man for work. 20 years ago, that's all you need to know. I might be panning for gold with a family in the Sierra foothills of California with a whole bunch of people who are completely obsessed with gold. Did they find gold? Just a little. I might be feeding llamas. Oh, sorry, that's an alpaca. 
I'm really glad I didn't say that in front of any of the people at the Tenacious Unicorn Ranch, which is a uh, anti-fascist haven operated by an amazing group of trans women, and what they do is raise alpacas and live in a geodesic dome. Don't call them llamas. They're not. Uh, I might be working in an Amazon warehouse. There we go. Um, taking stealth photos and video using a little camera hidden in a key fob that looked like it was for my van. Or I might be helping this dude, who is the sole caretaker for the only 300 cows. Uh, they're called that because that's what their cry sounds like. Don't ask me to imitate it. I asked him, and it was fantastic. Um, but I might be helping him uh, tag their legs so they can figure out where the heck they go uh, when they're not here in his arms. Uh, yes, he got bit. That, bike, uh, that beak is really, really sharp. So I wouldn't recommend handling them. I held one, didn't get bit, wouldn't do it again. Uh, sugar beet harvest. Again, another job I probably wouldn't go back to. Helping lead diesel trucks into a giant hangar like this. I don't know if you know, but half of the sugar in America comes from cane. Half of it comes from these ugly little beasts named sugar beets. Some of them are the size of bowling balls, and they come in on diesel trucks. And I swear, when I left, I was wondering if there were bodies under that pile. <laughs> Weird job. Uh, might be up in an airplane with somebody who is flying abortion patients out of states where they can't access care anymore on short trips to get them to other states and other clinics. Or I might be putting diapers on a baby lamb. <laughs> Don't ask. I mean, I might tell you, but not right now. Uh, anyhow, I also spent months living in a camper van for a project that lasted three years and took more than 15,000 miles of driving from coast to coast and from Mexico to the Canadian border uh, for a book I wrote called Nomadland. So that is my job. It's called immersion journalism. It means you spend days, months, and sometimes years shadowing other people to get a sense of who they are and how they live. When I was growing up, parents used to tell everybody, don't talk to strangers. I mean, especially strangers in a van. Uh, now my job is rebelling against that advice every single day. I do the opposite to an extreme. I don't just talk to strangers, but I live alongside them. I embed, I observe them, and I experience what they do. That's why I'm saying I'm not an expert, because it's my job to go out and learn. I meet people where they are, and then spend a ton of time with them. If I were an anthropologist or maybe a sociologist, I would call this participant observation. If I were doing this without a professional purpose, I might call it being a stalker. When I'm describing it to my students, I like to call it productive hanging out with PDS, people doing stuff, which is very different than PSS, people saying stuff. Anyhow, I am kind of a professional stalker. I'm a journalist who shows up and two years later still hasn't gone away. Surprise! <laughs> Don't hang out with me, you might regret it. So why would anybody want to do that? Let me rewind a little bit and give a little big picture. So much of how we think these days is about speed. It's about instantaneous reactions. Something happens in the world, you go on social media, there's a million hot takes on whatever it is. Everyone has an opinion. Just about nobody's digging deeper for information and understanding by engaging and connecting with other people who are actually impacted by whatever it is that's going on. Let's say you go online, and forgive me, I'm the queen of horrible analogies, so I'm gonna lay one on you. Let's say you read something about poachers. Hunters are going deep into a forest somewhere and they are killing a rare hippopotamus. How dare they? How very dare they? Everyone on TikTok is saying that's horrible. They're talking about how greedy these poachers are. If you're a reporter for a daily news website, maybe you call the forest ranger for a quote to run in a short story. Maybe a television news crew goes to the forest and they get some footage of the rangers talking and some bleached hippopotamus bones. An immersion journalist would probably go and visit the poachers and spend time with them and maybe learn some more complicated truths. They're all from the same marginalized ethnic group and because of centuries old local prejudices, they can't get hired for other jobs and their families depend on that nutrient rich hippo meat for survival. Does that mean the hippo should be hunted to extinction? Probably not. But it does mean it's worth slowing down a little before going on TikTok and bad-mouthing the hunters. In other words, 
Things are about always more messy and more complicated when you get close. That's what reality is. As an immersion journalist, I don't want to reduce reality into a narrative that is simple and easy to consume. That's any one thing. One of my favorite nonfiction writers, Rebecca Solnit, once said, it's our job to make things more complex. But that means getting close. There's a lot of talk these days about safe spaces, and that's well and good. But as an immersion journalist, I don't want to spend time in places where I feel safe, where everybody looks and talks like me. Yeah, I feel comfortable there, but I don't really learn anything new. To learn new things and grow, I want to break out of my comfort zone. It's a little bit of a cliche, but I do call it comfort zone jailbreak. And there's a certain kind of discomfort that I think is actually healthy. Is it fun? No. But whenever I feel it, I'm like, OK, I guess I'm on the right track because this is awkward. Like right now. <laughs> right now. I still get nervous when I do that. So I must be doing the right thing, right? It's, it's, it's got to be great. Um, Journalism has this amazing power to connect us with people who are not like ourselves. True stories can uplift marginalized voices. They can carve out a space for empathy and hope. But finding those kinds of stories means reporting outside the bounds of your understanding. You'll have to talk to people who don't look like you, don't speak like you, and you'll have to admit to yourself just how much it is that you do not know. Thankfully, your job is to learn. Uh, one of the best things about being a journalist is that it's getting to go to school forever, yay. Except the professors are more interesting, I'll say, than me. I'm not dissing any present company. And you don't have to pay tuition. So another one of my favorite writers, this guy Ted Conover, he's amazing. He traveled with coyotes, which is the name for the job people who are bringing in immigrants from Mexico without papers. He spent a year working as a jail guard in a prison called Sing Sing in upstate New York because, you know, America's prison population is the second in the world. We might have a bit of a problem with mass incarceration. And he wanted to get inside. And he didn't want to do it by getting arrested. Um, when I've talked to him about it, he actually told me that he did try to just follow a jail guard for a while. He followed the jail guard around. And what happened was he felt like he was on a giant cruise ship. And every time the cruise ship docked at some beautiful port, he felt like a tourist who got off in a big, loud Hawaiian shirt with hibiscus blossoms. And everybody who actually lived in this place acted out the story they thought he wanted to see or the one they wanted to show him. And he got back on the boat, and everybody went back to living their lives. That's not what he wanted to see. He wanted to see what was actually happening. So why I do immersion? One reason is selfish. We only get to live one life. And I want to slip into as many as I can. Also, I believe it's important to help people connect with strangers. It's so easy to be scared of things we don't understand. When people get to see each other up close, the world is a much better place. So to get up close, maybe a little TMI, there were some people in my life who were a little weird the first time I told them I had a girlfriend. One person in my family always changed the topic to talk about her garden. That was painful. But when they actually meet a specific person, for the record, her name is Julia, they spend time with her, and she is awesome. She's not some abstract thing anymore. I believe immersion journalism can also create that sort of human connection. If you go deep with somebody and show what you've learned to the reader, kind of drop them into the scene, I think that people can know each other better. I'm a bit of a hippie. I think it might create a better world. I don't know. Um, this is Lamont Ellis. Lavon lives in this van. She is making pancakes. Uh, there was a point while I was reporting the book Nomadland that I thought I would never get in Lavon's van, because the first time I met Lavon, I walked up. She was running a brunch. I brought a box of eggs. She said, we've got a lot of eggs already. I said, oh, OK, I should have brought juice. And then she looked at me and said, oh, you're that journalist who's been hanging around camp. And you are going to make us out to be a bunch of homeless vagabonds. And I said, Ugh. I felt very uncomfortable. So I'm not going to argue with her in front of the entire camp. I think I kind of shrank back. But guess what? Three days later, I was still there. And we started to talk. And she told me all about how and why she ended up living in a van. And it was a really hard story. But it was the kind of thing that when I was hanging out a lot, you know, I'm trying to become part of the furniture. So 
So when people feel like they have a sense of you, the relationship changes. They don't think you're just dropping in to get that hot take and then running away. So I think it's worth the wait. The goal is telling stories in a way that feels deep and intimate and true. We want to create the kind of writing that makes people feel interconnected, that makes them see the common humanity, even with people whose lives are really different. I think the beauty and power of close-up stories is that they help us feel beyond the limits of our own small lives. Stories are a powerful weapon against stigma. They push back against prejudice. They value human dignity. And they make us, both tellers and subjects, less alone in the world. I believe that they are a pixel in the larger picture of progress. So I want to share a little bit of my immersion experience with you through the prism of this book I wrote, Nomadland. The very last thing I wrote, and I'll tell you why in a minute, was the introduction. I'd like to read a little bit to you, and then I promise it will make sense. So here we go. Awkward. As I write this, they are scattered across the country. In Drayton, North Dakota, a former San Francisco cab driver, 67, labors at the annual sugar beet harvest. He works from sunrise until sunset in temperatures that dip below freezing, helping trucks that roll in from the fields disgorge multi-ton loads of beets. At night, he slips in the van that has been his home ever since Uber squeezed him out of the taxi industry and making the rent became impossible. In Campbellsville, Kentucky, a 66-year-old ex-general contractor stows merchandise during the overnight shift at an Amazon warehouse, pushing a wheeled cart for miles along the concrete floor. It's mind-numbing work, and she struggles to scan each item accurately, hoping to avoid getting fired. In the morning, she returns to her tiny trailer, moored at one of several mobile home parks that contract with Amazon to put up nomadic workers like her. In New Bern, North Carolina, a woman whose home is a teardrop-style teardrop trailer, so small it can be pulled with a motorcycle, is couch surfing with a friend while hunting for work. Even with a master's degree, the 38-year-old Nebraska native can't find a job despite filling out hundreds of applications in the past month alone. She knows the sugar beet harvest is hiring, but traveling halfway across the country would require more cash than she has. Losing her job at a nonprofit a few years ago is one of the reasons she moved into that trailer in the first place. After the funding for her job ran out, she couldn't afford rent on top of paying off student loans. In San Marcos, California, a 30-something couple in a 1975 GMC motorhome is running a roadside pumpkin stand with a children's carnival and a petting zoo, which they had five days to set up from scratch on a vacant dirt lot. In a few weeks, they'll switch to selling Christmas trees. In Colorado Springs, Colorado, a 72-year-old van dweller who cracked three ribs doing a campground maintenance job is recuperating while visiting with family. There have always been drifters, hobos, restless souls, but now, in the third millennium, a new kind of wandering tribe is emerging. People who never imagined being nomads are hitting the road. They're giving up traditional houses and apartments to live in what some call wheel estate. Vans, secondhand RVs, school buses, pickup campers, travel trailers, and plain old sedans. They're driving away from the impossible choices that face what used to be the middle class. Decisions like, would you rather have food or dental work? Pay your mortgage or your electric bill? Make a car payment or buy medicine? Cover rent or student loans? Purchase warm clothes or gas for your commute? For many, the answer seemed radical at first. You can't give yourself a raise, but what about cutting your biggest expense? Trading a stick and brick domicile for life on wheels. Some call them homeless. The new nomads reject that label. Equipped with both shelter and transportation, they've adopted a different word. They refer to themselves quite simply as houseless. From a distance, many of them could be mistaken for carefree retired RVers. On occasions when they treat themselves to a movie or dinner at a restaurant, they blend with the crowd. In mindset and appearance, they're largely middle class. They wash their clothes at laundromats, and they join fitness clubs to use the showers. Many took to the road after their savings were obliterated by the Great Recession. To keep their, cas their gas tanks and bellies full, they worked long hours at hard physical jobs. In a time of flat wages and rising housing costs, they have unshackled themselves from rent and mortgages as a way to get by. They're surviving America. But for them, as for anyone, survival isn't enough. 
So what began as a last ditch effort has become a battle cry for something greater. Being human means yearning for more than subsistence. As much as food or shelter, we require hope. And there is hope on the road. It's a byproduct of forward momentum, a sense of opportunity as wide as the country itself, a bone deep conviction that something better will come. It's just ahead in the next town, the next gig, the next chance encounter with a stranger. As it happens, some of those strangers are nomads too. When they meet online or at a job or camping way off the grid, tribes begin to form. There's a common understanding, a kinship. When someone's van breaks down, they pass the hat. There's a contagious feeling. Something big is happening. The country is changing rapidly. The old structures are crumbling away, and they're at the epicenter of something new. Around a shared campfire in the middle of the night, it can feel like a glimpse of utopia. As I write, it is autumn. Soon winter will come. Routine layoffs will start at the seasonal jobs. The nomads will pack up camp and return to their real home, the road, moving like blood cells through the veins of the country. They'll set out in search of friends and family, or just a place that's warm. Some will journey clear across the continent. All will count the miles, which unspool like film strips of America. Fast food joints and shopping malls, fields dormant under frost, featureless plains, feedlots, dead factories, subdivisions, and big box stores, snow-capped peaks, the roadside reels past through the day and into darkness until fatigue sets in. Bleary-eyed, they find places to pull off the road and rest in Walmart parking lots, on quiet suburban streets, at truck stops amid the lullaby of idling diesel engines. Then, in the early morning hours, before anyone notices, they're back on the highway. Driving on, they're secure in this knowledge, the last free place in America is a parking spot. It took me five minutes to read that to you, but it took me weeks, maybe months, to write it. The first draft was a hot mess, and it was the very last thing I wrote out of the whole book because there's three years of reporting in that. There's a whole process of writing a book behind it and thinking and just letting things bounce around in the rock tumbler of your brain. It has a point of view of what's going on in the world and in the world of this subculture in particular, but it's not a hot take. It is like the slow food movement version of a take. It is based on the slowest process ever. Spending time with people, learning, thinking, making connections, and writing. So uh, how the heck did Nomadland happen? A lot of times when I talk to people, they want to know, where do you get ideas to do these writing projects? And when I used to go and listen to talk to writers, you know, listen to writers talk, because I always wanted to write, it seemed like people had these cool ideas hit them like lightning, or that they came fully formed out of their heads, like the way Athena supposedly came out of Zeus's noggin or something. Um, that's not really how it works. Uh, it's a little boring, um, so bear with me for one sec. As a writer, I read a lot. I do that. I slow down, and I read, and I think. And there was one story I read, this story in particular, and the writer went into an Amazon warehouse and was working undercover, and that was all well and good, but there were two paragraphs that stood out to me. And in those two paragraphs, somebody came up to the reporter and said, yeah, you know, I work here and I live full time in an RV. And I do this because I can't afford to retire. This was an older worker. And there's a whole program for people like us. And I said, wait, what? Like I wanted to throw the magazine over my shoulder. There's like a whole program for people like you, for like older people who can't afford to retire and are living in RVs and traveling around the country. So I went down a bit of a rabbit hole I started looking everywhere and realizing that not only did Amazon have a program to hire these people, this program called Camper Force, but there were dozens, maybe hundreds of other jobs, everything from working at tourist traps like Walmart and Dollywood to, not Walmart, sorry, Waldrug. Walmart might be a tourist trap, but if you're a really boring tourist, if you're going to Walmart, that is like the worst staycation I can imagine, and I'm sorry, don't do it. Uh, but these people had all sorts of jobs, and a lot of them weren't jobs that were really suited for older bodies. 
Um, so I was saying, okay, something's missing here. And one thing I wish that I'd learned earlier was to actually kind of honor that feeling in myself instead of saying, okay, somebody else must have this figured out. Who cares? No, if you have something that really lights you up or makes you curious, it's possible nobody's really bothered to figure it out. So it's worth remembering. If you're reading the news and two things don't add up, think about it. There might be an idea there. There might be an idea that nobody's thought of following yet. So I decided to follow it. And that's how, in the winter of 2014, I ended up in the Sonoran Desert in western Arizona. I had a tent. I had a rental car. I had this lovely pleather jacket I got at Target, $40. Uh, I had a stack of notebooks and not much else. It was like negative 20 some nights. I'm not kidding. This was a bad idea. I told you I'm not an expert. Um, so I was on my first ever reporting trip for Harper's. This was a magazine I'd admired for many years. But the person I was supposed to write about, who I'd proposed a story on, he told me he couldn't be a part of the story anymore. He had good reasons for that. He was this older guy. He was living in a trailer with this really cute chihuahua. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met. But he also got hired full time to work at Amazon. And I hadn't met anybody in Camper Force who'd had that happen. And I said, hmm. And he said, well, if I come out in the press and talk about you know, what this job is like, I will get the ACS. And I said, what's the ACS? Help me here. He said, the Amazon cold shoulder. That's when you like go up to work with your ID badge and it doesn't open the door anymore. And I was like, okay, we can't do that because I'm a human before I'm a journalist. And I was like, uh, okay, what do I do? So this blows a hole in all of my careful planning. I was afraid I'd lose the assignment. I had two weeks in the desert with my tent to figure things out. So again, the story. Older Americans can't afford to live in houses and apartments anymore, can't afford to retire. A lot of the people who were doing these transient jobs found that the jobs grew scarce after Christmas. When it got really cold, a lot of the campgrounds were shut down. There wasn't that much to do. The beet harvest was over. People kind of hunker down. So people in this community would go to the Sonoran Desert in Arizona where the days were mild and they could camp out and kind of go financially dormant while spending very little money. Solar panels used to be really expensive. Nowadays, they're super cheap. So people basically have their own power generating life support capsules, these vans and RVs that they're living in. And just going there and camping for months at a time and spending as little money as they can. Um, I actually found out about that from the guy I couldn't write about anymore. And he told me once it was spring break, he said spring break for seniors. And then he saw that I'd written the Burning Man book and he wanted to go to Burning Man and he said, it's Burning Man for geezers, you have to go. I said, OK. Um, so I showed up. It was really weird. I swear, everybody in town was either in their mid-20s or under. And a lot of them were self-described traveling kids. So like self-described crust punks, like a lot of you know, big gay jeerings and a lot of beat up black clothing and a lot of really, really cute dogs with big eyes. Uh, or people who were going to the rainbow gatherings, kind of modern day hippies. And everybody else was over 60. So I was in my 30s. You've got everybody who's like under 25 or over 60. And I would walk into a pharmacy, and it would be like the cowboy from the wrong side of town walking into the saloon, and the two doors slam behind, and everybody's like, what are you doing here? Awkward. Uh, so I'm out there. The magazine had offered to put me up in a nearby hotel for two nights. But I knew that wasn't going to be enough time to go deep with any kind of story. So I set up this tent. This isn't even my tent. My tent was kind of wrecked by Burning Man, uh, not something that I really wanted to camp in anymore. Uh, so I set up this tent, my friend's tent, in this incredible wasteland. Imagine, again, a Western film. There are saguaro cactuses everywhere. They're the cartoony kind that kind of stand like this. Uh, and I remember going by them and being like, the landscape is giving me the finger in the middle. Why are they doing that? Um, and just calling my friends and feeling like I was in a postcard. Um, at night, temperatures drop below freezing. I could hear coyotes howling outside my tent, for real. There were many times I thought the whole thing was a very, very bad idea, and I should probably quit. Fast forward seven years. The magazine ended up publishing the story on the front cover. An editor gave me a contract to expand the story into a book, which became a three-year reporting project that I called Nomadland. Then an actress named Frances McDormand, who I knew from the movie Fargo, said she wanted to make it into a movie, and she did. It got nominated for six Academy Awards. 
you know, starring in the movie were two of the main people from the book I'd written. They were playing versions of themselves. This is somebody named Swanky. She's awesome. She just sold that van in part because she got a bigger van with the movie, with the movie money. She wants to stay in a van. She could have gotten a house um, and managed to sell that by plastering Nomadland stuff all over it and saying, this van was in a movie. <laughs> she sent me pictures of her like sitting in a parking lot. There was somebody giving camel rides on the other side of the parking lot. She's sitting there with like her Nomadland stuff being like, buy my van, it was in a movie. <laughs> it took a little longer than it should have and I think she was a little embarrassed by that. Um, anyhow. She was in it, playing a version of herself. So was the fabulous Linda May, who I still talk to all that time. Uh, and before I knew it, these two women, who I met way out in the desert, in the middle of some pretty hard times, were walking the red carpet at the Oscars ceremony. This is Linda getting her makeup on. I did not get to go, but I did want to go be like the support team. It was COVID year, so I think they were limited to under 200 people. Nobody cares about the writer in Hollywood, just so you know, if you plan on going there. New York is a town for writers, my friends. Hollywood is warmer. Um, so here's Linda getting her makeup put on. She's the talent. Um, and here's a picture. If anybody's like uh, filming anything, don't share this picture, because Linda would kill me. She had to get COVID tested every day, and I kind of photobombed her. And I do not, that's not my hand. That's her hand. But when the picture came out, we realized it looked like my hand. I thought it was hilarious. It's sent it to her whole family, done. Um, and there they are, looking beautiful. It was like sending my elders off to the prom. It was the weirdest thing ever. Like I said, I have a really weird job. When I look back at that condensed timeline, it does seem kind of like a smooth ride. But behind the scenes, the whole thing was very messy, like reality, and serendipitous, and yes, very, very, very weird. To be honest, if anybody asked me, I would have told them that Nomadland seemed like the least likely candidate for a motion picture. It lacks all of the essential Hollywood ingredients. There is no sex. There are no drugs. There is no violence. There is no youth. There is no wealth. There is no celebrity. What's left in Hollywood for Hollywood? This did not go unnoticed. There was a reviewer named Caitlin Flanagan. When she saw the movie, she wrote, Nomadland is a movie that appeals to the four quadrants of the show business apocalypse. <laughs> Menopausal women, people with life-threatening illnesses, people interested in poverty, and anyone with time on our hands who can't find the remote. It's a popcorn picture for the damned, and so it spoke to me. So I want to tell you a little bit more about uncertainty, serendipity, and weirdness. Because what we do in immersion journalism involves a lot of all three. And I really wish somebody had explained that to me back at the beginning. Reality and current events, they're like a pickup truck speeding down the highway. And what we're doing, we're hanging off the back, doing our best not to lose our grip. So I want you to remember an important truth. You cannot write the script for what will happen when you report a story or when you work on any long project, just like you cannot write the script for your own life. What you can do is drive like crazy in the direction that makes the most sense at the time. And if you find that the road has flooded out, or the overpass has crumbled, or the pavement has melted into hot tar, because all of these things will happen, you figure out a way to keep going. What will make you stand apart, no matter what you do in life, is how you adapt to those challenges. You will have plans. Sometimes, maybe often, those plans will fall apart. So you will make more plans. When I was doing the research for Nomadland, there were so many times the whole project could have and maybe should have imploded. Three years working on this book, living out of a camper van for months at a time, so many things went wrong. There was the night I got bit in the leg, hard, by a chihuahua. I thought I might have rabies. I went back to the tent, like, you know, just, oh no, like, um, very hard. The time I backed the van into a boulder, I did that hard, too. Uh, I encountered another boulder. They do not like me. I don't know what I did. Bad boulder karma. And I encountered this boulder, and I tripped over it. I was actually coming out of a vault toilet in the middle of the desert. And I live in New York. I grew up in New Jersey, where at night, the sky is kind of purple from the glow of New York and possibly some air pollution and maybe some clouds. And you go and you look at New York, and it's like the stars are in the ground because you see all the lights before they get concentrated into the city. It's a little dystopian sometimes. However, 
when I got to the desert, there were so many stars. So I basically walked out of the toilet, went, oh, stars, and <laughs> fell over a boulder. The boulder was there, so somebody didn't back into the toilet with a man. And I probably would have done that, too, if it weren't for the boulder. But I did think I dislocated my shoulder. I thought the project was over. Uh, next morning, I was fine. Once I drove for two days, I went way up into the mountains to meet a person who never showed up. I will never forget the smell of burning plastic from when I drove down a very steep, long forest road. Downshift people. If you grow up somewhere that's flat, you don't know about downshifting, you don't know about engine braking, I don't know. In New Jersey, they didn't even let us pump our own gas. That was embarrassing when I went to college. Um, so I'll never forget that smell of burning plastic. I was driving down a very steep, long forest road and it got so hot, the brakes, that they melted the sensors on my anti-lock system. Good luck finding new anti-lock brakes for a 1996 GMC Vandora. It took me about two years. Uh, I've gotten the van stuck at least four times. This van is not only 19 feet long, it weighs four tons. Most of that, I think, is particle board. You know the stuff that they make IKEA furniture with? Uh, this van came furnished with a great deal of particle board. I know it's that heavy for sure because I got yelled at. I drove it onto one of those truck scales on the side of the road. They said, ma'am, you're not supposed to do that. And they said, but look, it's four tons. Uh, there was another time I spent in Texas tornado country. The sky turned green. I swear, it was practically, the birds were practically flying backwards. I went into a coffee shop and I said, what do you do when this happens? What do you do? And the barista, thankfully, I'd had a sip of coffee before she told me this said I should take cover in the basement. Camper vans, as you may know, lack basements. I was in Texas once. I went undercover at this Amazon warehouse with that program, Camper Force. Camper Force hired many of the older RVers I'd met to do this physically challenging work at this breakneck pace over the winter holidays. It was the lead up to the commercial bonanza of the year, you know, Christmas. It's like everybody's just shopping, because that's how we express love now. I don't know how that happened. Um, so everybody's shopping. Um, so before Nomadland, I had never done undercover reporting. I was really nervous. Things went wrong. That made me more nervous. I showed up at the warehouse for my first work shift, and that storm was still hanging out. It tore through the parking lot. The back of my van, where I built a small electrical system from a roof-mounted solar panel, started to flood. I solved the problem by parking on an incline, nose down, so the water would stream down the front, and then I went to work, visibly jangled. Days later, I was reporting for my final shift. I only worked a week. This is because I'm a writer, not a, not a warehouse worker, although you start getting so into it, you actually feel guilty about quitting. That could just be me. Um, so days later, I reported for this last shift, but I was late, which I also felt bad about because I'd been interviewing off-duty camper force workers at a Buffalo Wild Wings restaurant. That turned out to be the best thing ever, because it meant my supervisor had to find another job for me. You saw I was doing that job where I was like putting the things in the bins, like you kind of figure that out after a day or two, and it's like put in the bins, put in the bins. Okay, I, I can talk about this now. So first, I got assigned to drive a forklift, which I don't know anything about, and you have to be certified and so, you know, we spent half an hour going back and forth on why uh, I probably shouldn't drive a forklift. Then they reassigned me to sort through broken merchandise in an area of the warehouse called Damage Land. This was fascinating work. They gave me a little cart to push. I could push my little secret camera on it and pretend I was doing steady cam. I called it not so steady cam. There was all sorts of weird stuff back there. It was like the island of misfit toys, things people returned and you wonder why they bought them. There was a towel that said butt on one side and face on the other. Who knew? <laughs> but again, this was so good to write about. I can't even tell you. It was, it was kind of gold and also entertained me a lot. But I never would have gotten to do that work if I had not screwed up and been late. So I have come to believe that if things don't ever go wrong when you're trying to do a project, you're actually not doing it right. You're playing it safe. And safe is not really where the best stories or best experience or best projects are. Safe isn't how you grow. So <clears throat> on uncertainty, I wanted to share a little bit more with you. And then I want to answer almost anything you might have to ask me. <laughs> um, but this is the kind of scene that doesn't happen. You would never know about it 
unless you were being a stalker, a professional stalker and following someone around. And I'll tell you why after I read it. It's short. On the Foothill Freeway, about an hour inland from Los Angeles, a mountain range looms ahead of northbound traffic, bringing suburbia to a sudden stop. This wilderness is the southern edge of the San Bernardino Mountains, a tall, precipitous escarpment, in the words of the United States Geological Survey. It's part of a formation that began growing 11 million years ago along the San Andreas Fault and is still rising today, gaining a few millimeters each year as the Pacific and North American plates grind past each other. The peaks appear to grow much faster, however, when you are driving straight at them. They're the kind of sight that makes you sit up straighter and starts a swelling sensation in your chest, a feeling like helium crowding your rib cage enough perhaps to carry you away. Linda May grips her steering wheel and watches the approaching mountains through bifocals with rose-colored frames. Her silver hair, which falls past her shoulders, is pulled back from her face in a plastic lorette. She turns off the Foothill Freeway onto Highway 330, also known as City Creek Road. For a couple of miles, the pavement runs flat and wide. Then it tapers to a steep serpentine with just one lane in either direction, starting the ascent into the San Bernardino National Forest. The 64-year-old grandmother is driving a Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo, which was totaled and salvaged before she bought it off a tow lot. The check engine light is finicky. It has a habit of flashing on when nothing is actually wrong, and a close look reveals that the white paint on the hood, which was crumpled and then replaced, is a half shade off from the rest of the body. But after months of repairs, the vehicle is finally roadworthy. A mechanic installed a new camshaft and lifters, Linda spruced up what she could, scrubbing the foggy headlights with an old t-shirt and insect repellent. Uh, note to everyone, that actually works. A do-it-yourself trick. So for the first time, the Jeep is towing Linda's home. A tiny, pale yellow trailer she calls the squeeze in. If visitors don't get that name on first mention, she puts it in a sentence. Yeah, there's room, squeeze in, and smiles, revealing deep laugh lines. This trailer is a molded fiberglass relic a Hunter Compact II built in 1974, originally advertised as a crowning achievement in travel for fun that would follow like a kitten on the open road, track like a tiger when the going gets rough. Four decades along, the squeeze-in feels like a charmingly retro life support capsule, a box with rounded edges and sloped sides geometrically reminiscent of the styrofoam clamshell containers once used at hamburger joints, and now you know I'm older than you because they don't do that anymore, which is great. Um, Inside, it measures 10 feet from end to end. That's roughly the same interior length as the covered wagon that carried Linda's own great-great-great-grandmother across the country more than a century ago. It has some distinctive 1970s touches. Quilted, cream-colored pleather covering the walls and the ceiling. Linoleum with a mustard and avocado pattern on the floor. The roof is just high enough for Linda to stand. After buying it at auction, this trailer, for $1,400, she described it on Facebook. It is five foot three inside, and I am five two. She wrote, perfect fit. Linda's hauling the squeeze in up to Hannah Flat, a campground in the pine forest northwest of Big Bear Lake. It's May, and she plans to stay there through September. But unlike the thousands of warm weather visitors who travel for pleasure each year to the San Bernardino National Forest, Linda is making this journey for work. It's her third summer working as a campground host, a seasonal gig that's equal parts janitor, cashier, groundskeeper, security guard, and welcoming committee. She's enthusiastic about starting that job, getting the annual raise for returning workers that will bump up her hourly wage to 9.35, up 20 cents from the year before. At the time, California's minimum wage was just $9 an hour. And though she and other campground hosts are hired at will, According to the company's written employment policy, meaning they can be fired at any time without cause or notice, she's been told to expect a full 40 hours each week. Some first-time campground hosts expect a paid vacation in paradise, and it's hard to blame them because you've got these ads for the job. They're splashed with photos of glittering creeks and wildflower-choked meadows. One brochure shows gray-haired women smiling delightedly on a sun-dappled lake shore, arm in arm, like best friends at summer camp. Get paid to go camping, cajoles a recruiting banner. Another company, American Land and Leisure, has that banner for hiring camp hosts. Below that headline, there are all these testimonials. Our staff says, retirement has never been this fun. We've developed lifelong friendships. 
We're healthier than we've been in years. But let me tell you, newbies are known for balking and sometimes quitting when faced with the less picturesque parts of the job. Babysitting drunk, noisy campers, shoveling heaps of ash and broken glass from the campfire pits because rowdy visitors like dropping bottles into the flames to make them explode. Don't do that, I'm not trying to give you bad ideas here. The thrice daily ritual of cleaning outhouses. Though tending toilets is most of their unfavorite chore, it's their most favorite, sorry, it's the campground host's least favorite chore, Linda isn't phased by it. She even takes a little pride in performing it well. I want them clean because my campers are using them, she says. I'm not a germaphobe. You snap on some rubber gloves and you do it. I'll add here that um, something that didn't come out in the news is that later both Linda and Swanky managed in separate incidents to break a rib on this job. So anything that makes the job look like nice and fun and hospitality and blah, it's a little, um, I don't know if anybody's seen the Lego movie. Do you know the song that goes, everything is awesome? That's like really sarcastic. Yeah, we got some like, I, I'm kind of a big fan of that. I have a tank top that I'm obviously not gonna wear for you, but it says, everything is awesome. Once I showed up at Burning Man playing that song at full volume and just drove around my campmate's site for about three minutes to make everybody bonkers. Anyhow, I digress and I'm almost done. But as Linda reaches the San Bernardino Mountains, the valley views are sublime, but they are distracting. Sorry, everybody got excited, Legos, I do too. Uh, the roadside is narrow. There's barely enough of an edge to call a shoulder. Along some stretches, there's nothing but empty air past the ribbon of pavement that clings to the slope. None of this seems to rattle Linda. Her stint as a long haul trucker, nearly two decades ago, left her undaunted by difficult roads. But I'm driving a camper van just ahead of Linda. As a long form nonfiction immersion writer, I've been spending time with on and off at this point for a year and a half. Between in-person visits, we speak on the phone so many times that every call I anticipate her familiar greeting before she picks up the phone. It's a melodic, hello, spoken in the three, this three note sing song you'd use to say, I see you, when playing peekaboo with an infant. When the steep climb into the San Bernardino Mountains begins, my giddiness at seeing the peaks from a distance fades. Suddenly, I'm anxious, nothing new. Uh, the idea of driving switchbacks in my clunky van scares me a little. Discomfort. Uh, watching Linda pull the squeeze in in her rattle trap Jeep scares me a lot. Earlier, she told me to drive ahead of her. She wanted to be in the rear following, but why? Did she think her trailer could come unhitched and backslide? I never found out. Past the first sign for the San Bernardino National Forest, a shiny oil tanker truck looms up behind the squeeze in. The driver seems impatient, a bit too close, as they enter a series of S curves that obscure Linda from my sight in the rearview mirror. I keep watching for her Jeep. When the road straighten out, straightens out again, it doesn't emerge. Instead, the tanker reappears on the uphill straightaway. There's no sign of Linda. Pulling into a turnout, I dial her cell phone and hope for that familiar, hello, the call rings and rings, then goes to voicemail. I park the van, hop out, and pace nervously along the driver's side. I try again, no answer. By now, more cars, maybe half a dozen, have come out of the curves onto the straightaway and past the turnout. I try to push down a queasy feeling, adrenaline blooming into panic as the minutes slide past. The squeeze in has disappeared. Ooh, suspense. I just wanted to share that with you because A, everything went wrong, and B, if I'd talked to Linda on the phone after that happened, you know what she would have said? Whatever, nothing, nothing happened today. So someone else's nothing can be your everything and it's really good to show up. And I think I'm probably just riding the edge at the time. So let's see if anybody's got a question. I have oh, a microphone sorry, if anybody wants to ask a question, raise your hand. Hi, um, my name is An. I wanted to ask what you study in university and how that kind of leads to your first job or like eventually leads down. Yeah, um, I had a very weird road, that should not surprise you. I was an English and French major and I had interned at Scholastic, the publishing house, with somebody who brought books over from other countries and translated them and brought them into English. And I thought that was really cool because a lot of Americans don't have passports. And I was like, if people start reading international lit as kids, it might change some things. 
it turned out that was the guy who ended up bringing Harry Potter into the US. Uh, huh? uh, the first, I remember learning how to use a letter opener. It was on the first box of Harry Potter's. It looked like a little sword. It was very weird. Um, but then 9-11 happened. I'm condensing this. Um, watching that happen downtown, I think kind of defibrillated everybody a little bit. And I started thinking a lot harder about what I wanted to do with stories. I started going to grad school part time uh, at Columbia without quitting my day job. And I've kind of got converted. And I, it's been that way ever since. Although when you go to grad school at like an Ivy, and then you're like, look, I'm in a van, people would want to know what happened. <laughs> Getting your exercise. Hi, yeah, sorry. My name is Laisha. I'm a senior. And I read an article that you wrote about um, abortion laws within different states um, and just your experience with seeing that. Do you ever get any backlash for it? And like, has it ever made you feel like you needed to stop writing? Um, I am always, it's funny, I feel like when you're doing the writing, you almost have to forget that people are reading it um, because. I'm, I'm, I'm terrified. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I feel like part of the discipline that I do, um, I'm a formerly shy kid. I would not be one of the ones asking questions right now. I give you great kudos. Um, but part of what I've tried to learn to do is to be uncomfortable with a certain amount of discomfort and a certain kind of discomfort when I'm like, OK, I'm growing. This is good. I can hang with this. I was very surprised that I did not get a lot of backlash for that Atlantic cover story. Um, I mean, I did get a little bit of uh, we're watching you kind of creepy mail. Um, but you're going to get mail from a few crazies. I use a wonderful service called Delete Me, where you can get your address purged from the internet. I wish I'd known about that during the Snowden stuff. That's another story I'll tell you another time. Um, so short story long, like everything else, it's complicated. But I'm going to keep writing. Hi there. How do you approach the people you're going to study? Poorly. <laughs> I'm looking for a picture right now. I thought I had a picture of Linda. Um, so there's Linda. Um, Linda and I, Linda used to joke she was going to write a memoir called Can I Pet Your Dog? I really like dogs. Linda and I had the same type of dogs. We have known each other for so long that our dogs are no longer with us, which is a great sadness. Um, but that was my way in. Can I pet your dog? I ask people questions. I look for areas of common experience, and then I, I tell them pretty quickly I'm a writer. I don't want to pretend I'm just a dog aficionado. Um, but, but I look for just a conversational way in, and I feel awkward. Common theme. All right, I think this is uh, the last question we have time for. Um, have you written any other books? And if so, what's your favorite one? OK. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wrote a book on Burning Man. People make fun of Burning Man now. It was a different time. Um, I'm actually really proud of it. I wrote a book with my best friend called Snowden's Box about being the unwitting mules for the whole NSA archive, which showed up at my apartment in Brooklyn back when it was very easy to find my address. Another story for another time. But the project of any of those that I've been most passionate about so far has been Nomadland. And I'm still, that's why I love talking about it. I like sharing it. I, it doesn't, doesn't even really feel like it's about me. I feel like I picked up some water and I carried it somewhere else. Um, because this stuff isn't really about us. It's about the stories. So if you see me in the hallway, you can ask me anything you want. I'll just pretend I don't see you. Um, and thank you so much for being a great audience. Thank you.